Mary said it was like an out-of-body experience. It was a feeling she never had before. She said it was as if her whole body had floated into the air and she was left staring from above at her frail, skeleton-like figure on the chair below her. She was pale, weathered. She'd given up on buying fancy, overpriced clothes and putting on expensive makeup. She'd lost all interest in being the person she used to be. The whole ordeal had caused her forehead wrinkles to deepen and her eyes were now centered around brand new creases that had surfaced to remind her she was no longer a youngster in her prime. She moved focus off herself and examined the room around her. It was bland, cold, unloved. A bit like herself, she thought. The blinds in the doctor's office were caught in a crease in the corner, which left them crooked and slightly raised on one side. She focused on this minute detail for the entire meeting. She couldn't take her eyes off it. All she wanted to do was jump off her chair, undo the crease and straighten the blind. A stupid detail to focus on, given the circumstances. But her brain wouldn't let her concentrate on anything else. She'd ambition in life. Had been the operative word. She wanted a nice car, a career, a nice house, and a husband that would love her. Love her despite all her faults. Unfortunately, destiny thought otherwise. She'd often thought about putting her artistic talents to use by portraying her love life in painting form. But every attempt at this left her staring at a white canvas with intermittent patches of murky grey chaotic swirls, symbolising the loss and the heartbreak of the many men she'd let go from her grasp in her short life to date. Even with her failed love life, she'd achieved most of her life goals. She had a car, a nice house, and a career that took her to see places she never imagined seeing. But even with all of this, she couldn't shake her insecurities for long enough to be happy. She would often think about giving it all up and traveling, breaking all of the connections to hospitals, home, work, and normality, and moving around foreign lands and meeting new people. People who had no idea about her background, her illness, her life to date. She would spend her free time Googling foreign countries and plotting and planning. How much money she'd get if she sold all of her belongings, her house, her car, her laptop. She would calculate how long she could live off this sum without needing to come home. She imagined that this might get her to the end of her days comfortably without being a burden on anyone else. Unfortunately though, she was going to be a burden. Something she never wanted to be. Her whole life was mapped out from the day she was born. She was a medical miracle. She defied all odds from the very beginning. Now should have been her time to shine. But it was not meant to be. Her illness had caught up with her. As the wind blew in from the other side of the office, she felt a cooling air on her cheek. Her hair blew into her face and the familiar scent of her shampoo tickled her nose. The tickle of hair on her face broke her stare at the crooked blind and she returned to her own body, interrupting her wondering if life would have been simpler if she'd given up years ago. She realised that, although she is fighting an uphill battle, it was the support of her family that kept her going. The hand-holding, the late-night phone conversations, the fundraising for alternative treatments. They had focused their whole lives on making her life easier, better, 
Norma. As the doctor finished going through the checklist in front of him, he asked, Have you anything to say? She turned to me, grabbed my hand, and said with a smile, Thank you for everything. What is normal? How can you define it? Is it simply doing the same thing as everyone else is, or is it going through a routine that we never really had to sacrifice before? In the last few weeks, I've been adjusting to life in a way which is like living in some sort of dystopian universe where we have to wear masks and clean hands with what feels like tons of hand sanitizer and avoid standing too close to people. Two meters! plastered all over every shop, queue, and park walkway. A simple distance that's intended to help separate an infection that will, ironically, one day bring us back closer than ever. It's not just the distance that's tough. Not being able to hug a loved one, or shake hands with someone, or even being able to go for a walk, to meet friends, without having to be questioned by the guardies to why you're out. Enjoying the leaving cert weather in a time where there is no leaving cert. No school, even. As silly as it may sound, I miss getting a haircut. I miss going to a cafe for a coffee and a chat. I miss going to the cinema and eating popcorn. I miss being able to go to a match. I miss being able to go to a concert or a festival. And I miss being able to get on a plane and fly to whatever corner of the globe I want to. The only positive side effect of this current way of life is that we as a nation have been brought closer together, helping neighbours and elderly relatives with their shopping, checking in on people to see if they're okay both mentally and physically, and not to mention the huge gestures of goodwill for charities and our frontline workers. Now, when this all kicked off, I'll admit, I was one of the ones who laughed it off. Ah, it's only a flu. We won't have to worry about seeing it over here. (laughs) How wrong I was. I know I'm one of the lucky ones. And that... People have been much worse off than I am. It's... It's just that... These are such uncertain times. We've seen stuff like this only ever happen in movies. I look forward to the day when we can look back on these times and... Think to ourselves how lucky we were. How we lived a life full of restrictions for weeks and months and came out to freedom on the other side. I do hope that when we return to a somewhat normal society, we appreciate the things that we may have unintentionally taken for granted because you never truly know what the future holds. I'm okay. Well, not okay. I'm alright. Not alright. I'm fine. Well, no, not fine. I'm not. How do I feel? Okay, (laughs) hold on to your hat. Everything is awful. I'm disturbed. I'm always so tired but can never sleep. I never want to eat but I'm always hungry. I want to laugh without feeling a twinge of sadness on the inside. Not forgetting the fact that I'm educated. Oh, evil of evils. You know, you're probably just not pumping my meals with enough vitamins. Vitamin A or C or D or better yet, just some nutritious food. The real sunshine vitamin. You keep asking what's the matter with me, well here. The matter is that there's so little good in the world that I'm not even motivated to look for it anymore. The matter is that my body is shit, my teeth are too big, my legs are too hairy. My face couldn't even be served as pudding. There's so much off about it. I can't sleep. Oh god, I want to sleep, to sleep, to sleep. Is there anything in the world more dystopian than a gym? Your dinner? Let's call a spade a spade. Your dinner was awful. I hate potatoes. I hate that there is nowhere in this house where you can't hear someone else speaking. You could be having a conversation downstairs and I want nothing more than to tell you to shut the hell up. 
I'm sorry. I'm just upset. I'm not okay right now. I'm not right. Please, it's, it's not your fault. None of this is your fault. You're doing the best that you can, and the best that you can is more than anyone would ever want to have to do. For Christ's sake, your husband left you and me, and you think you're the bad parent. Can I be excused? I would like to keep reading my book. Hello there. I have an issue. No. No. I would like to speak to... No. That's not right either. How about... This. This is an outrage. Too strong. Oh, why on earth did it make things so difficult? Why can't more people in the world not think like me? I don't come from the wealthiest of folks. Dad only has the whole Lambo and Mum only has the Jack. My friends? They live in mansions. We only have the one guest house. I, I try my best to bring people up to my level. Okay. Let's try this again. <coughs> Excuse me. I am appalled by the sheer ignorance that I, I have had to put up with. I mean, seriously, how hard can it be to stack a shelf correctly? I, come on! Am I going to waste my breath explaining this to you? Get me your manager! <sighs> oh. <laughs> Surely you can't misunderstand that. I've expressed my utter dissatisfaction and did the low level, low educated person a favour by not confusing them my issues. Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, I must be an exemplary customer. How do I get this across to the manager? Surely I must be... Surely I must be entitled to some sort of... Some sort of compensation for my issues or oh, for the trauma this has caused me. Oh, you know, the last time I had to venture out like this, I was so offended. I mean, seriously, who did that guy think he was? <sighs> Telling me to sanitize my hands, like, seriously. I can ask, I, I can certainly understand if they ask 
and nobody. <laughs> but like, I don't look anyway scruffy. I'm wearing Tommy Hilfiger for God's sake. Okay. How should I finish my conversation? Ah oh, yes. As I previously mentioned to your colleague, I previously mentioned to your colleague, I have an issue. And I expect a return immediately. Now, before you say anything, I have read your returns policy and well, I think this should be the exception. I, I know it says usable's not refundable, but come on. And, and I know it said hard of the packaging, but this is just ridiculous. And I uh, have lost the receipt, but I, I, I assure you, I did buy it here. Who even holds on to them anymore? <laughs> and I expect an incentive for if, if if you ever expect me to to shop here again. <sighs> Fantastic! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I am a genius of words. A modern day Shakespeare. Ah, oh, I can't see how this conversation could go any other way. Oh, where's my sheets? I'll take these ones. <laughs> now. <coughs> Excuse me. Strange times are being had right now. We'll remember this in 20 years time apparently, and even look back fondly on lockdown. Well, I suppose the struggle of World War II sounds almost romantically united at this distance in time, with the blitz bears and dig for victory. Forget those poor souls in the trenches. Now we have to stay together apart and we're all in this together. Maybe in years to come they'll be reprinted like those keep calm and carry on posters, which people could decorate their living room with. During this really strange time, I am on the front line. The one everyone's talking about. Healthcare, public facing, dealing with the sick in this time of the pandemic. They use this word, heroes, which is very flattering and very kind. And yes, it's dangerous, but isn't that kind of what we signed up for? Not the risk of getting really sick. That's just a new low of the job. But being around the sickness bit. If I had wanted to stay away from sick people, this really was the wrong job choice for me. For a minute though, let's consider the people who keep our world spinning. Whilst we go to work to treat the sick, and people watch us, and praise us, someone delivers my oil. Someone else stocks the shops I go to to get a much-needed lunch. Someone mends the roads I use to get to work. Someone else is there to replace the tires on my car. Without them, I can tell you for sure that the world wouldn't continue to work. My world wouldn't continue to work. They don't get the praise. They don't get the presence. Or the label of heroes. They didn't sign up to be surrounded by sick people, nor did they think their day would be surrounded by plastic screens, alcohol gel, and plastic gloves. So why do we not honour these professions? Why not tell them that they're doing well and that they're digging for victory? But in all of this, the biggest impact in me has been my nightly allocated exercise, walking in this newly quiet world 
very seldomly seeing others as we mend the lanes, has been seeing two small beings whose world has changed completely. They're not going to school, not seeing their friends, not allowed out of the house. But still, they smile cheekily on seeing a puppy, chat through the fence or wave from the window with their stay safe rainbow picture above their heads, saying, look at the doggy. She can't come in. And then, bye, with the biggest waves and biggest smiles. Flop down on the grass as gracefully as my aching legs lay, which is as graceful as a sausage in a frying bun. My body is wrecked after the morning session. In full starfish pose, I gaze up at a million shades of green, fresh, lush leaves on giant granddaddy trees. The sun is sizzling me like my sausage spirit animal. I roll over twice and find the shade. Resume starfish. Dublin is looking feckin' gorgeous today. I don't even want to look at my phone. I don't want to talk to anyone and I don't want to text anyone. I just want to feel the blood coursing through me, seeping into those torn and bruised muscles, knitting me back together. I've got a coffee and a brownie and an orange juice. It's astonishing how calm everything is. Yeah, the coronavirus is great, says old Martin. His son is working from home now and has loads more time to help on the farm. The old crota is great in Wisconsin, but it's even better in Dublin. Every big bum Barbara in the city is taking up jogging. It's great to see. And the junkies and alcos are more visible now. Not that they've staked a renewed claim on the streets, but without the usual swarms of shoppers and commuters, they're all that's left. Besides the barbers, I find the contrast amusing. Like the cobbled streets and brick warehouses still hanging in there among the glass banks and offices down the docklands. Like monuments to the inevitable inconsistency of all things. Two lunch break colleagues pass me by. And I'm like, call me, you know. Don't fucking email me when you know I won't be logged on after six. Like, what am I supposed to do? There are a million levels to human banality. I wonder if she gets as much pleasure venting her frustration as I do massaging my thighs. A painful kind of therapy. But at least I'm not broadcasting my problems to every singer in the park. Not to mention wasting her co-worker's precious lunch break by filling her ears with unpleasant nonsense. My state of meditation has been dashed, so I re- roll over and read my book, trying not to judge the loud complainer too harshly. I try to sympathise. In a parallel universe, that could be me. Boring office job, emails and meetings and all. I remain on guard against versions of myself that epitomise those things I hate. Those fickle values that eat away at your soul. I used to drink a lot when I was a teenager. What if I'd become an alcoholic? Tried to join the army once but failed the interview. What if I'd become a mindless grunt? Even, even in small things, those bad versions can crawl up behind you and dig their claws in. I just finished my brownie. If I don't get my sugar cravings under control, I'll have diabetes or cancer before I'm 50. 
But I'm lonely for the other versions of myself. Not good ones or bad ones, just other ones. What if the acting thing had worked out? Or what if my songs had been played on the radio? It's like thinking about someone you loved, but haven't heard from in years. Where are they now? What clothes do they wear? Do they have many friends? But they're beyond my reach. I'm grieving for all of them. But they're not really dead. My life has changed, that's all. I'm lonely now. But I was loved once. I'm limping today. But tomorrow I'll be stronger. I love the contrast. Some things are inevitable. People change and life goes on. But the combination of coffee, brownie and orange juice produces consistent results and I have to get home. Lockdown means there's no pubs to sneak in to, to, take, to run to the jacks. As I'm crossing the River Liffey, I snap a photo of the water and the Samuel Beckett Bridge under the hot sun from my Instagram story. Dublin is looking hashtag feckin' gorgeous today. Does birdsong have lyrics? Like, is there a jukebox of bird songs that they all know? I know there's science and logic behind it, but is there a songwriter bird among the flock making up his own tunes? He's there singing away to himself, with the others giving him looks for not sticking to the repertoire. Surely some bird calls mean danger or I'm over here when friends get lost. But do they have a top 20? Is Rihanna ever in the charts? Parrots can replicate songs if they hear it a few times. I've seen them on YouTube. They're gas. But do they have accents like people? Surely a bird from Cork and one from Cavan sound different. Do birds know their birds? Do they call themselves birds in their language? Or is there another word for it? How rude of the first person to call a bird a bird. To not ask the birds themselves what they prefer to be referred to as. Maybe they did ask, and the bird said, my friends call me bird. But does that mean all the birds were called bird, or just that one bird in particular? My mam says I overthink. I don't have much else to do. I spend a lot of time wondering if I'm the only person who thinks about these things. Not just birds, I mean. I do all my thinking without ever researching to get the truth. I just take my own thoughts as fact, I suppose. In this case, Rihanna is currently top of the charts with sparrows. Blackbirds prefer Beyonce and crows like Leonard Cohen because they're a lot more solemn. But how would the birds hear Cohen? Or any of them? I mean, I'd have my radio on the odd time, but I doubt the birds are listening. The farmers have the radio on for the cows sometimes. John down the road plays Joe Duffy for them. Apparently they find it soothing. My nana likes Joe Duffy. I suppose cows have better faces for radio than birds. If birds are more into music, they would probably prefer CDs so there wouldn't be ads interrupting their music. Could you imagine a little robin going along with an iPod? Robins would be like my friend who listen exclusively to Christmas music all year round. Nostalgia, I suppose. Some people believe that robins symbolise loved ones that have passed on. Robins have a lot to live up to with all these associations. The same robin has been sitting in my garden for the past few months. My mam swears it's Nana. A small part of me hopes so too. I got the day off school today. I told mam there was going to be a load of free classes because everyone was going to a match. She went to work then and had the place to myself. 
I ate Weedabex and left my phone in my room and went to the forest. I was kind of worried that one of the neighbours would be wondering why I was out walking and not at school. But sure mum said I was allowed to stay at home. I can't wait to go to college and only have to go to lectures when I want to, not having to ask for permission to stay at home. I had the ring in my pocket. I was really nervous and excited to get rid of it. When I got to the clearing in the forest, I decided to sit and think for a while. I just do that sometimes, especially if I'm by myself. I love to think. People say when you overthink, it can be bad for you, but I love to let my brain talk to itself. I come up with some mad things, but it doesn't make me worried like it does for Greta's mom. That's why I started these recordings, to sort of keep track of where my thoughts go, in case they come in handy someday, like if I was to write a book or something. Hmm, I'd actually really like that, like Michelle Obama. I'd say a lot of my book would be kind of boring though. Anyways, I was in the forest and I saw the school bus go by in the distance, dropping people home, so I knew it was around four and I'd been out for a while, procrastinating. I started digging with a rock, but it was sort of useless, so I just started using my hands. The ground was really soft and the ring is small, so it'd be okay. I started thinking maybe what I was doing was littering, and if someone was to find this ring with a metal detector and find my fingerprints on it, I'd get a littering fine. But it was silver, not plastic, and it had no smell, so no fox would be digging it up and eating it by accident. I hope. As long as it was in the ground, ages away from anywhere and not in my drawer, I could relax. It was a stupid idea to take it, but I, I'm fixing the problem now by hiding it. I was going to give it back to Greta, but now I don't think that's such a good idea, because I think her mum knows I did it. Mum gave Greta a lift home from evening study last week, and Greta's mum just sort of looked at me, saying what a pity it was that Greta had lost her ring. She's a scary woman. She once gave out to me for saying her bald cat looked like an anorexic pig. And she made me stand in the corner. I was really scared, but I never told mom. It's kind of embarrassing. Also, Greta has her own friends now, and I'm happy for her. Even if they are kind of stupid and loud. We used to have good crack, but we don't all have in common anymore. She likes Glee. I like The Walking Dead. Her friends hang out in KFC. Mine hang out in Miss Rorden's classroom, which is grand, really. I can't believe I stole the girl's ring just so I could hang out with her and her friends in KFC. I don't even like the food there. As much as I like thinking, this hasn't been a fun thing to think about. I'm going, I'm going to go start on that, in, on that essay for English. I think I'm going to go write an essay in favour of vegetarianism.
and I was so nice about it. Like, anyone else would have been so pissed off that you copied. But I was so nice and defended you when everyone called you an original. And remember, everyone called you the Aldi version of me. And I defended you, even though it was hilarious. See, I knew you couldn't take the joke, so I didn't laugh. There have been so many times I've put out my neck cream, and you don't even know. All the times I'd asked the girls if it was okay if you came when we hung out, or all the times I'd invite you to my parties, even though you weren't friends with anyone there and were kind of out of place. See, I never left you out, because I'm a good friend, and that's what good friends do. But Neve told me what you said to her, about me, about how I've bullied you for years. That's bull, and you know it. Everything I've done is to try and keep you in the group, usually damaging my own reputation in the process. Anyway, that doesn't make up for what I did, but I just want to say that was really nasty of you. If anything, you're the bully.